Uh, I think it's impossible to be involved in as either a Palestinian or in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle without being called an anti-Semite or a self-hating Jew. Um, I, I don't know anybody who spent any time, not a week, a month, a year, 20, uh, without having this consistent assault on you. As if uh, to call out the crimes of Israel is to somehow um, equate the Jewish people with the state of Israel, which is something the Zionists do. It is something um, that, uh, that I do not. And that the BDS movement, that the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement certainly does not. I want to focus, you know, in many ways, I, I actually, I really agree with the way Omar Barghouti, who was one of the leading figures of the BDS movement, who we're trying to get here um, to, 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 to speak in the United States, his, his newest book, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, uh, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. I have an advanced copy here from Haymarket Books. Uh, it just came out this week. It'll be uh, uh, sold here in New York. Um, he was uh, scheduled to give a speaking tour starting early next month. So far, the U.S. government cahoots with the Israelis are not uh, giving him a visa. And uh, I think everybody here should go and uh, contact the consulate and put pressure. This is one of us uh, uh, speakers getting into the country in the past. It will win again if we make enough noise. And if you go to sherrytalksback.com, uh, you can just link to uh, uh, that information and please just make noise. Uh, it, it bugs them and they move. Uh, Omar Barghouti uh, basically describes this sort of charge of anti-Semitism. He says this is a form of intellectual terrorism. You basically uh, slander an entire movement with absolutely no proof whatsoever, uh, with no substantiation, when in fact the movement is not calling for any kind of attack on Jews, but an attack on a state that is with, uh, by anybody's measure uh, uh, racist and an apartheid state. And frankly, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take the words of Israelis. Um, I uh, have here, here's uh, the former Israeli Attorney General, uh, Michael Benier, wrote just a few years ago, eight years ago, he said, we enthusiastically chose to become a colonial society, ignoring international treaties, expropriating lands, transferring settlers from Israel to the occupied territories, engaging in theft and finding justification for all of these activities. Passionately desiring to keep the occupied territories, we developed two judi judicial systems, one progressive and liberal in Israel, and the other cruel and injurious in the occupied territories. In effect, we established an apartheid regime in the occupied territories immediately following their capture. That oppressive regime exists to this day. That's the Attorney General uh, in Israel. Um, then you move on and you see that a politician within Israel, again, a Zionist, perhaps a Zionist who dis uh, disagrees with many of the policies of the leading figures, but uh, a fellow by the name of Roman Bronfman, in 2005, the chair of the Democratic Choice Faction of the Ahad Party, criticized what he termed an apartheid regime in the occupied territories, but goes further. He says the policy of apartheid is also, and I agree with him here, infiltrated sovereign Israel and discriminates daily against Israeli Arabs and other minorities. The struggle against such a fascist viewpoint is the job of every humanist. That's an Israeli politician. And then we come to a community of South African Jews. Um, by the hundreds, they have signed onto a statement known as the Not in Our Names Declaration of Conscience. And it states, it becomes difficult, particularly from a South African perspective, not to draw parallels with the oppression experienced by Palestinians under the hand of Israel and the oppression experienced in South Africa under apartheid rule. And I can go on and on. Desmond Tutu, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from South Africa, Judith Butler, uh, the uh, queer studies icon, uh, in fact, uh, Holocaust su a survivor from Auschwitz, uh, physicist and member of the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, uh, Heil Meyer, uh, all are signatories to the boycott, divestment, uh, sanction struggle, all believe that Israel is an apartheid state. So um, you either uh, condemn all of these people, including many, many other uh, Holocaust survivors uh, who condemn the actions of the state of Israel as apartheid actions, as anti-Semites, or we simply throw out this ruse and this non-starter and have a real discussion about what the nature of the state of Israel is and how we're going to stop um, not only the humanitarian nightmare in Gaza, but actually what I see as an occupation of the Palestinian people's land ever since 1948, since the Nakba, the catastrophe. Um, I, I want to focus on a couple of points. Um, number one, in talking about and in equating Israel or calling Israel an apartheid state, it doesn't mean that it's an apartheid state in exactly the same way South Africa was. It's not true. Um, all apartheid states, I guess, are not the same. 
Um, because really in South Africa, the point of the occupation by the, um, and the rule of the, of the tiny white minority was not actually to ethnically cleanse the black population of South Africa, but to super exploit them. They were the miners, they ran transportation, as they do to this day, uh, and create all the wealth. They were the working class, um, controlled by a, system, a separate system of laws and past systems and all the rest of that uh, by a tiny uh, white uh, Occupy minority in that colonial uh, settler state. But the point um, in South Africa was to exploit the black population, whereas the point uh, uh, and the goal in Israel is to simply drive out the Palestinian population. And as one African socialist once uh, put it uh, uh, quite eloquently, if there's anything worse than being exploited, it's not being exploited. In fact, Palestinians have extraordinarily high levels, uh, devastating levels of unemployment, uh, and, and, and Israel over the last few decades in particular have simply eliminated the possibility of, uh, of Palestinians from, uh, from having any meaningful meaningful uh, work, which is why such a huge percentage, not only in the, inside of the occupied territories, relies on uh, international um, aid. So there are, of course, differences in the way uh, the apartheid systems operate, um, which has meanings uh, that I'll talk about in terms of, has meaning for us as international solidarity activists for what we ought to do. Because in many ways, it makes our role that much more important. Uh, whereas the black South African working class was able to literally go on strike, shut down production, and had that sort of social and economic lever uh, uh, at their uh, disposal and our international movement helped drive that forward. Um, in Israel and Palestine, you simply don't have that kind of power in the hands of the Palestinians in the same way. Um, so it, it is, it is it, in my mind, controvertibly and certainly in the minds of many Israelis, uh, an apartheid state. I want to talk about why the BDS movement is an excellent, excellent tactic um, for uh, activists to take up right now, not just student activists. You don't have to be a student to um, uh, get active in boycott, divestment, sanctions. First of all, we have to understand that as people who are progressives, it is our duty to fight for the self-determination uh, of other people. And in fact, this is a demand that the Palestinians themselves are making. This is not a demand being foisted upon Palestinians by others outside. So for, for those who throw up the red herring that this will somehow harm Palestinians, they are ignoring that this is a demand of um, no fewer than 170 civil society groups uh, of Palestinians. And we're not just talking about Palestinians within uh, uh, the occupied territories or Israel proper. We're talking about refugee uh, organizations, indigenous Palestinian citizens inside of Israel, and of course, um, Palestinians in the occupied territories. If there's perhaps one thing that unites Palestinians uh, among the many debates that they do have, it is a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And in that sense, I believe that is a way of supporting uh, and and, and giving a reality to the self-determination of a people to support this uh, unified demand that the Palestinians have. And I want to talk about the urgency. Now, Steve gave a lot of the, the facts and figures, um, and, and I think that people need to, to keep these in mind. I think we have to understand the urgency is not just about raising awareness of a humanitarian crisis, but actually being able to have an impact, a concrete, real impact on political lives, on the social lives of uh, Palestinians, not in some far off distant future, but today. The sooner Israel is made to be in the eyes of the world world's population a pariah state, and we get rid of this notion that there's some sort of democracy um, uh, uh, that, that prevails in this nation in which uh, the majority of the Palestinian population has no rights whatsoever uh, uh, that Israelis take for granted, um, the, the sooner we, we, we get to the, the moment when Palestinians can truly begin to see their liberation. Of course, you have you know, the facts like 95% of the water being completely unpotable. You have a health apartheid system in that country in which the rates of malignant diseases among Palestinians, and we're talking about it in Israel proper. Nobody has the figures for what they actually are in the occupied territories, but inside of Israel proper, among women, up 130% over the last 30 years. Among men, up 97% over the last 30 years. Nothing like those figures exist among uh, uh, the Israeli Jewish population. And really, if you understand that 67% of worldwide Palestinian population, which is to say 7.1 million people out of 10 0.6 million people, that's how many Palestinians uh, are estimated to be in the world, um, they remain forcibly displaced 
persons, uh, according to the uh, Badillo Resource Center in, uh, in Bethlehem. We can have a concrete impact on the lives of people in terms of uh, shining a light in the way that really for many of the people in this room, and I've, I've noticed over the last months, the size of crowds at Palestine Solidarity uh, activities or educational events uh, is actually you know, quite enormous in many places. It'll be 100 or so like it is tonight, sometimes it's hundreds. Um, nothing like this existed prior to the massacre um, that took place over uh, Memorial Day weekend of this last year when nine uh, humanitarian aid activists attempting to break the siege of Gaza were simply murdered uh, in cold blood by, uh, by, uh, by the Israeli uh, uh, forces, you know, um, and people were defending themselves with what, you know, cucumber knives and deck chairs, uh, known deadly weapons, uh, all of them. And, uh, and, and it really turned a tide in terms of consciousness. But I think we actually have to take that consciousness that people now have, that, that a serious injustice is happening in the world, and that our own government is in large part responsible for financing and enabling the state of Israel to continue its policy um, uh, uh, it, means, it means that we have to take the sentiment and actually turn it into active opposition to the state of Israel and a defunding campaign from the U.S. It would be inconceivable, the figure that Steve gives of $13,000 per capita uh, in Israel support, um, the, you know, that allows um, that sort of system to, 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 to survive. The U.S. gives it credibility, and frankly, you know, it's because Israel serves a very important purpose for the U.S. government. It's not simply that it's, uh, you know, an, a, a diplomatic nightmare for the U.S., although occasionally it is. It is, in the words, frankly, of, you know, of, of many politicians, probably best put by Jesse Holmes, a, a, a sort of aircraft carrier for U.S. imperialism in the Middle East. It is far cheaper for the U.S. government to pay the three to five billion dollars a year plus in, you know, in loan guarantees to have an indigenous population armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons threatening the region than to have to have, you know, the equivalent of the 82nd Airborne and various and sundry flotillas uh, in the region itself. It's a way of U.S. imperialism to be is getting away on the cheap by having the state of Israel do its bidding for it uh, in the Middle East. I, I think we have to understand an urgency of the situation, not simply because of the humanitarian nightmare, but because we can actually have an impact within our lifetimes. This is not something that needs to drag on for another 60 years, and it'll just be that you know, sort of primordial struggle uh, uh, that will always be in the background. Uh, and, and I think particularly in this moment, when internationalism and the idea that struggles across the world are actually meaningful to people, you know, who don't speak the same language, don't look the same, or whatever, is really, it's on the order of the day. I mean, look what's happening right now in Madison, Wisconsin, right? You have tens of thousands, the other day, hundreds of thousands of workers from across the country solidarizing against, you know, the attempt to bus unions. And what is it that they're doing? They're walking around with signs in this country, you know, in Ar translated into Arabic, some of them equating, you know, not making a direct equation, of course, with a struggle to bring down a dictatorship in Egypt, but equating the Governor Walker with Mubarak in the sense that here's somebody who by fiat uh, wants to control our lives. We, uh, we can identify with uh, the struggles in some ways and also understand that the Egyptians and the Tunisians and people throughout the Arab world are teaching us what it is and how it is that you can struggle and you can fight and you can occupy and you can say no and you can actually make uh, enormous changes. The idea that people in this country are translating picket signs in Arabic. I mean, this is, this is in the midst of some of the most noxious Islamophobia in this country that took off around that whole, you know, ground zero mosque controversy. You know, the, the mosque, the, 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 that's neither a ground zero nor a mosque, the community center uh, that has Islamic affiliation. Uh, you know, in that context, the idea that people in this country are beginning to solidarize with people of the Arab world you know, ratchets up the potential for this, uh, for this solidarity struggle with Palestinians to really take off. And I, I, I really uh, want to encourage people um, to not just sort of have educational meetings, but to use these meetings as centers for organizing. I've been to many, many meetings, including one uh, just here last week that was excellent, that SJP participated in with the Al Jazeera uh, editor. Again, a packed out room, many, many people there, I think 100 or so people were even turned away at that meeting. And yet, there isn't always yet, we haven't yet developed the consciousness, and we have to learn that quickly, that every meeting has to have an organizing aspect to it. Send around sign-up sheets at every single meeting. 
meeting, have people check off what it is that they can do. You know, I became political in the 1980s uh, as a university student, as a participant in the South African anti-apartheid struggle. We, we didn't, we, we screwed up a lot, believe me, we made nothing but mistakes for a long, long time, but we were successful in the divestment struggles, uh, you know, in the 1980s because we learned how to take a sort of loose sympathy and turned it into um, active, organized resistance. And that's where we need to take the next step. We have this enormous audience, this tremendous sympathy. But sympathy alone is not going to win this because the other side is learning lessons too. The Zionists are actually trying, they're brushing themselves off and picking themselves up after several, several months of an ideological defeat after the massacre on the Mavi Marmara flotilla where those nine humanitarian aid activists uh, uh, were killed. And beginning to use things like the existence of LGBT rights in Israel as a sort of club to beat anybody who's a Palestine solidarity activist as if somehow, you know, we're all in endorsing the policies of, uh, you know, the Wahhabist regimes uh, if you're in solidarity with Palestine. It's an absurdity. We have to know our stuff. We have to have a bit of a know your shit campaign, know what you're talking about, and actually mobilize um, solidarity. The weather's getting warmer. It's springtime. It's time to get out there with tables. And if I were a student on a university campus today, I'll tell you what I'd do. I would pick out a, a, a folding table. I'd put things like a kazoo, because all musical instruments are banned uh, as part of the siege of Gaza. I would put out some meat, and I'd maybe take a block of concrete, and I'd put it on the table and say, how do you kill someone with a kazoo? And I would have people pay attention to what it is, the absurdity of what is barred uh, inside the occupied territories, the absurdity of the apartheid state of Israel, the, the, the levels of uh, uh, gross uh, destruction, ignoring of human rights, of the most basic human rights of the Palestinian people, put it on display for everyone to see, have people sign on, on the petition and find places to go protest. To be honest, I love the Tia Kref campaign. I think it's wonderful. And you know what? The headquarters is right here in Manhattan. If I were a student in SJP, I would have a mobilizing meeting, bring all the SJPs together and all the various groups, existence is resistance, siege buses and all the rest, and let's have a protest outside Tia Kref and mobilize some of the voices that we're beginning to gather on these petitions. These are the sorts of things that we can do. This is the sort of concrete solidarity we can, we can make. You know, this is, they brought down a dictator in Egypt, something that nobody thought was possible in our lifetimes. They've done it. We've now seen the beginnings of a two-sided class war in this country. We're beginning to see the realization of internationalism in practice. We are going to win this. This is not just one of those sort of dreamy things, because well, as we learned in Egypt, you know, the people who were considered dreamers at one point are now quite pragmatists. Socialists for many, many decades have said the road to the liberation of the Palestinian people comes to the Egyptian revolution. And people would laugh and say, ha! When the hell is that going to happen? Well, it's just begun to happen. So let's dream a little, let's get active, let's get organized, and let's move forward.